Let us all talk to our Heavenly Father. Eternal God, we come to you this morning as creatures come to their Creator. You made us. You made us for yourself. And we gladly come back now and ask that you will make us again what you meant us to be when with a word from heaven you said, let us make men. And there he was. We come to you, O God, not only as creatures to a creator, we come to you as sinners to a savior because we are not what we were. And every one of our lives has been spoiled by something this week that has hurt one of your children, grieved your Holy Spirit, Help to make this world a more difficult place for your creatures to live in. And so we come as sinners to a Savior. But we come also, O oh God, as children to a Father. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, we dare to come and say, Abba, Dad, and ask that you will take us, your children, into your loving arms this morning and speak to us in our day and in our generation, that we may speak to others. And on this, our anniversary, we thank you that you have always been the same, that even though the people who built this place in which we worship are now gone and in glory, yet you are still the same God that they knew. And when we read about them and hear about their lives, we realize we have a long way to go to catch up with those who've gone before. We thank you for the communion of saints, for the knowledge that we are not alone as we worship, that not only are we joined by all your people the world over who name the name of Jesus, not only are we joined by the angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who will be so thrilled if someone comes to Christ this day, but we are joined together by the great company of those who have lived and died in your faith and fear. The greater part of our church here is now in heaven, and we rejoice with them and stretch out our hands to Christ, knowing that he has them in his other hand. And so, Lord, may the church militant and the church triumphant, the church on earth and the church in heaven, worship you this day as you deserve. We ask it for Jesus' sake and in his name. Amen. We turn this morning to the book of Nehemiah. Best way to find it, open your Bible in the middle and you'll be in the Psalms and work backwards through Job, Esther, and you'll come to Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, and part of chapter 2. We're going on this morning studying the prayers of the saints of the Old Testament, and today we come to the builder, the man who built the walls of Jerusalem. And this is so appropriate for our anniversary and what we're going to do later. The book of Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with certain men out of Judea, and I asked them concerning the Jews that survived, who had escaped exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors there in the province who escaped exile are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let thy ear be attentive and thy eyes open to hear the prayer of thy servant, which I now pray before thee day and night for the people of Israel, thy servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Yea, I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances 
which thou didst command thy servant Moses. Remember the word which thou didst command thy servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your dispersed be under the farthest skies, I will gather them thence and bring them to the place which I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, let thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who delight to fear thy name and give success to thy servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king, and in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing else but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, For what do you make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me, to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house which I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. I began this series by saying that you learn far more about prayer by listening to people pray than by hearing talks or reading books about it, though there's a place for that too. And we've been listening over hearing the prayers of Moses and of Hannah and of Samuel, and this morning I want you to listen to Nehemiah praying, a great man of prayer. But I love this man, Nehemiah, because his prayer didn't take him into the clouds it kept his feet firmly on the ground. And this man was a sensible, practical man. And this is a lovely combination. The men who can pray and work. The men who can lift holy hands to heaven and the men who can take a trowel in their hands and do a bit of bricklaying and a sword in their hand and do a bit of fighting. And that's what Nehemiah did. He was a lovely combination of heaven and earth. It's sometimes said of saints, they are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly use. Some are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly use. And God needs men of both. After all, God made the heaven and the earth, and he wants us to be equally useful in both. Now let me just set the historical scene, and you've got the picture. The Jews had disobeyed God. They knew the commandments, and they thought that they were modern and they thought the commandments were old-fashioned. There's nothing very modern about this, is there? And so they disobeyed, and God said, Right, I promised you to give you this land, to give you this site, if I may use that word, this site, for your place of prayer. But if you're not going to be obedient children, out you go. And they had been taken off into Babylon and suffered terribly. But Babylon had been defeated by Persia, who were kinder to the Jews, allowed some Jews to go back home. Others had escaped the Babylonian exile by hiding, 
And so you had this position. The majority of Jews were still in Babylon, which was now Persia, but being more kindly treated and rising to positions of high status. This man, Nehemiah, was now cupbearer to the king. And you had a small nucleus of those who had escaped, who were back in Jerusalem, living in the ruins of their city in the land of God's choice. Now that's the historical setting. And the first prayer of Nehemiah, which is the longest prayer he ever prayed, it lasted about three months, is found in chapter 1. It began in the month Chislev, and it ended in the month Nisan. And you must take my word for it, that's about three months. Well, now that's quite a prayer. We have only a summary of it here. But the first thing we're going to learn is this, that if you're really going to get an answer to prayer, you'll need to keep on. This is what we mean by importunate prayer. When did you last pray day and night for three months for something? When did you last fast and pray for three months for something? When did you last weep and mourn for something for three months? You can expect an answer if you've done that. For tears are the best lubrication for prayer. One thinks of great preachers. I'm thinking of one now in Scotland who changed the face of Scotland. And when he came to Edinburgh or Glasgow, he would walk around the streets crying and saying, Oh God, give me Scotland! And God gave him Scotland. And so Nehemiah's first prayer was three months long, from the month Chislev to the month Nisan. Why did he pray and what was he praying about? Well, he'd had a visit from someone way back in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah's first thought was, what's the city of God like? Is it getting built? Are the walls going up? What's happening there? And the sad story was, there's nothing happening. We are going to be very personal about this later. Philip Carlinis, our financial secretary who's in charge of the building fund, is going to share just a little testimony of what God said to him at Hildenborough. Our new building should have started January the 1st. It will start tomorrow morning. That's a delay. Nehemiah had this kind of disappointment. Is it going up yet? Are the walls rising? The answer came no. So he prayed, and he fasted, and he wept, and he mourned, and he didn't go to bed. He did it day and night for three months. This is what he prayed. First of all, there is the note of confession in his prayer. It's so easy when you have a delay to look around and find someone to blame for it. It's so easy to look around and say, who's responsible? And say, it's them. It's him. Whereas Nehemiah got down on his knees and said, God, it's us. It's me. And he felt that the delay in building was due to the fact that God felt his people were not ready for building. And so he began by confessing his sins. I want you to notice that he didn't say them once. It's so easy to look out on the nation of Britain, for example, and say them, look at them, look at that lot. Look at him, blame the Labour government, blame the Tories, blame Heath, blame Wilson. But Nehemiah said, I and my fathers have sinned. We've all been responsible for disobedience to your commandments and statutes and ordinances. He wasn't going to blame anyone else. He was going to look within and say, have I contributed in any way to this delay by disobedience? Could I have held the work up by a sin in my heart? Could my fathers have held the work up? And the Bible is quite clear that the sin of even one man among the people of God can hold up the progress of the people of God. One thinks of the sin of Achan, when they tried to defeat Ai as they defeated Jericho, and one man held it up. And Nehemiah said, This delay, Lord, why aren't the walls going up? I and my fathers have sinned. There must be some reason in us for this delay. And he turned this in on himself. That's quite a prayer. The second note in his prayer is a note of meditation. He claims the words of God even where they are against him. One of our besetting sins is to pick out the words from the Bible that are for us and ignore those that are against us. So we have our promise boxes, but I've never heard yet 
of a book being produced that is a summary of all that the Bible says about our sins. I've seen loads of collections of nice promises, but Nehemiah said, Lord, I remember your word. You said that if we disobeyed, we were out. But Lord, you also said that if we were returned and obeyed, you'd have us back in. I'm claiming both. I'm confessing the one and I'm claiming the other. And he meditates on God's promises both ways. God has promised to send people to hell as well as promising to take them to heaven. God has promised to curse if we disobey as well as to bless if we obey. And Nehemiah was honest enough to say, God, I'm taking the whole of your word, not just the nice bit. You said you'd put us out of the land. Fair enough, we deserved it, but Lord, you said you'd have us back if we confess. And I confess. And the third note in his prayer is a note of supplication, verse 11. A note that asks specifically for help with one man on one day. One of the reasons we don't see answers to our prayers is that we're not specific enough. We don't ask for particular things enough. We say, Lord, bless us generally. But you know what they prayed here? Or what he prayed? He said, Lord, give me success before this man today. And this man was the king Artaxerxes, not a Christian, not a Jew, not a believer, not part of God's people. And yet Nehemiah says, Lord, when we meet this man today, give me success. And a prayer that's definite, you can soon find out if it's answered or not. If he just said, Lord, pour your blessing out, he wouldn't have known if it were answered. But because he said specifically, I'm meeting this man today, give me success. At the end of that day, he could report answered prayer. Well, now, we turn to chapter 2, verse 4, the shortest prayer that Nehemiah ever prayed. If the longest lasted three months, the shortest lasted three seconds. And again, you have a lovely combination. Some people always pray at length. Some people are always brief. Nehemiah was both. And it's lovely when you hear someone who's used to praying for 20 minutes in a prayer meeting pray for one. Sometimes it's lovely to hear someone who just prays briefly going on. In fact, no, I better not say it, but I'd love to be able to reverse the position sometimes. Well, now Nehemiah did. You notice it was because he prayed for three months that he was able to pray for three seconds. If your life is used to meditation and background prayer and seeking the Lord on your own, then you have a right to utter what is called ejaculatory prayer. And do you know what the word ejaculatory means? It's Latin for a swift dart. So if ever you've played darts, you're ejaculating. And that's what it means. And it means to ejaculate a prayer is to send a dart of prayer to heaven in an instant. And this comes out in chapter 2, verse 4. The king noticed him looking very unhappy, and he said, Nehemiah, what's the matter? You're not ill? And it simply says, so I prayed to the king, God of heaven, and I said to the king. Now, he can't have kept the king, king waiting. You don't keep kings waiting. You don't say, excuse me for half an hour, I'm going to have a quiet time, then I'll answer your question. He prayed to the God of heaven and he said to the king. In a flash he just said, God, oh, tell me what to say. Here's the opportunity. And I could bungle it. I could spoil it. I could get in the way. Now, just supposing he hadn't uttered that three-second prayer, the three-months prayer could have been undone by an unwise word. But you see, the three months prayer was now backed up by a three second prayer. Oh God, set a guard on my lips. I don't know what Nehemiah prayed, but I'd like to guarantee he said, Lord, just tell me what to say. And then he said to the king, I'm unhappy because the city of my fathers is broken down. The city that they built up, the place that they built to worship God, it's, it's gone. I can understand a little bit of this unhappiness when I go through a town and I see a chapel that's now a furniture store. And I see another that's now a bingo hall. And I see another that's a supermarket. And I think of those who built those places. Those who packed it with people of prayer and who sought God's face. And there they are, empty, disused or abused or used for some other purpose. And Nehemiah felt that way about all that his fathers had built up. 
So he said to the king, the boldness of his petition, he said, well, I would like leave of absence, I would like a passport, and I would like timber. Now there's nothing vague about that. There's his order. Fancy asking a king for that. There's a hymn in this book that says this in one verse. Large petitions with thee bring, thou art coming to a king. If you went to see the Queen of England and she said, what would you like me to do for you? Would you say, I'd love a packet of Maltesers? Would you say, well, I'd love a five-penny stamp because I want to write to a relative of mine? Of course you wouldn't. You'd think, the Queen, she could give me anything. I'm going to ask for something big. And Nehemiah asks for leave of absence, a passport and enough timber and building materials to put the walls up and a house for himself. I love that touch. <laughs> he said, I'll need somewhere to live, so you better give me enough timber and bricks for my house too. Well, if going to an earthly king draws out large petitions, should we not who go to the king of kings set no limits to what we ask for? Be it unto us according to our faith. If we ask for ten pounds, we're likely to get ten pounds. If we ask for ten thousand, we've got a God who says, the silver and the gold is mine. All that is in the earth is his. So he asked for these three things, and the king said, when will you be back? And he knew that he'd got his request. When will you be back? So he set a time. Now the secret of these prayers was in verse 8. The hand of my God was upon me. Now that surprises me. I would have thought it would have said, for the hand of God was on Artaxerxes. But that's not what it said. And we have sometimes prayed, perhaps wrongly, that the hand of God would be on the Guildford Borough Council and on the planning authorities and on this, that, and the other. But maybe the only thing we really needed was that the hand of God should be on us. If the hand of God is on us, then who can stand in our way? Who could refuse a request? That's why Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost is come to you, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He didn't say, when the Holy Ghost is come to the world, but when the Holy Ghost is come to you. The secret of our success is not so much that God should have his hand on everybody else, but that he should have his hand on us. Because God plus us, why, that's a majority. And nobody can stand in the way of that majority. Well, now, those are his first prayers, a lovely combination of a very long prayer and a very short prayer. But a man who got answers because he was specific and claimed the promise of God. Now, let's turn to chapters 4 and 6. They started building the wall. And there was an awkward man called Sanballat. And in Sanballat I can see Satan progressively trying to stop the work. Now though we've got the final word that we shall start tomorrow and we'll see the bulldozers in tomorrow, Satan could do anything but in the next 12 months to stop it going right through anything. We've had the most unexpected delays already. Things out of the blue from quarter we never expected. Well, Satan hasn't done yet. I believe that Satan doesn't want that building up in Millmead. He doesn't want it to be anything more than a cardboard model if he can help it. Sanballat didn't want the walls of Jerusalem up. And four progressively difficult attacks he made. First of all, he tried to discourage them. Secondly, he tried to disturb them. Thirdly, he tried to distract them. And fourthly, he tried to deceive them. And this got more and more subtle. And every time Nehemiah met it with what? With prayer. And with action. Now the first two attacks were simply aimed to create failure. So that the building would get halfway up and people would say, there is that monstrosity, that half-built building. Look at it, they started and they couldn't finish. And the second two were designed to make them afraid, to produce fear in their hearts, to be daunted by the project, to be afraid of the consequences of going ahead. 
Now we'll look at these four. First of all, we notice that Sanballat was angry when he heard that we were building the wall. Verse 1, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he ridiculed the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brethren and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore things? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? And Tobiah the Ammonite was by him and he said, yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt upon their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from thy sight, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So we built the wall. And all, its, all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. We had a lovely word from Victor Paul last Sunday night in the young people's meeting about that phrase, we had a mind to work. Well, now they ridiculed them and they said, look at it, you can push those walls over anyway. A fox could pull it down. And they laughed and they ridiculed and they mocked and they said, do you think they'll build it in a day? And people can laugh. Do you know this building in which we meet was built in one year? The church meeting decided to put this up, and one year later it was up. And that's progress, as we've said. But uh, now we've been talking about this for some years. But people said, will it be built in a day? There were those who said to us at the beginning, aren't you being too ambitious? Isn't the whole thing too big and too much for you? Will you ever complete it? There were people who said this right at the beginning of the project. I want them to know that our place will not be big enough for God's people and for God's word. I want them to know that perhaps, if anything, we've been too small and that we're not finished yet, even when that building is finished, that the work of God is going on and must go on. No one's going to make us fail through discouragement. No one's going to daunt us with the task as if what we're doing is too big for us. No one's going to laugh at this work. It's God who's going to do it. And God said, turn the taunt on their heads. Oh God, you have the last laugh. You ridicule them. Show them that the day of your people is not finished, that the church is not dead because you are not dead. Show them. And it's a tremendous prayer. Some people would say it's a prayer of vengeance. It isn't. It's a prayer saying, Lord, turn their own weapon against themselves. They've used ridicule, ridicule, then you ridicule them. The second was more serious. It was disturbance. Verse 7, when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, that's quite a list of people, isn't it, heard that the repairing of the walls was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. I don't know what they prayed this time, but it was a practical prayer. They prayed to God and they set a watch. They kept their eyes open. They were on their guard. And the confusion was going to be caused in Jerusalem. Satan would love to cause confusion in our church over the next 12 months before ever we get into the new building. He'd love to get in among us and set people against each other. He'd love to confuse us. What are we going to do? We're going to pray and we're going to set a guard and we're going to be on sentry duty. And when old Sanballat comes anywhere near us, we're going to tell the rest. Don't listen to him. Don't let him in. Don't let him confuse. So they got worse and worse. And in chapter 6, they invited Nehemiah to come for a dialogue. They invited him to come and speak at a conference. They invited him to join a committee. And in chapter 6, verse 3, he says, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Again, I love Nehemiah's reaction to being invited to a dialogue. I'm too busy to talk. I'm doing a great work and I'm going to get on with it. I just can't come down and talk to you. Of course, if he'd gone, then they were plotting to trap him. The talk would have trapped him. 
and they were trying to frighten him. Verse 9 says, For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen thou my hands. There is a time when we should not talk and when we should get on with the job, when we should work. There's a time when you could just simply spend all your days talking and discussing and arguing and differing. And what God wants is people get on with the job. It is one of the besetting diseases of the church at the moment, I think, that we set up committee after committee, conference after conference. We're always talking about these things. But again, as I said last Sunday night, or when did I say it, it's like Mark Twain talking about the weather. He said everybody's talking about it, but nobody's doing anything about it. We're having conferences on evangelism. We're having committees on this, that, and the other. What we need are a few more near miles to say, I'm not going to come and talk about it. I'm too busy doing it. I'm at the front line. I'm in the battle. Can't come back to talk. I'm doing a great work and I can't come down now. And I pray to God, strengthen my hands. Keep me at it to build up the work. And finally, they tried something very subtle. They tried to deceive by a false prophecy. And the false prophet came and said in the name of God to Nehemiah, run away from this situation. It's too much for you. They're going to get you. Flee, hide in the temple. And Nehemiah realized that in fact this prophecy was from, God, from the devil and not from God. And in verse 14 he prayed again, Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Do you notice there was a prophetess there uttering wrong words, trying to frighten this man of God? Well, now those are the second prayers, the second set of prayers. Each time discouragement, disturbance, distraction, and deception came, Nehemiah straight away prayed, Oh God, keep me at it. Keep me unafraid. Help me to see the thing through. And he got by. Let me say this. If you think his prayers are prayers of revenge, Lord, punish these people. They're not. I'll tell you what he's doing. He's doing the only right thing. When someone is trying to hurt you, ask God to repay them. Don't you do it. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. I'll deal with what he's done wrong. If he thirsts, give him a drink. I'll deal with him in his crime and in his vice. And so when we are tempted to revenge, let's do what Nehemiah does. Don't try to get your own back. Don't try to hit those who hit us, say, God, I'll leave them to you. You will deal with them. And we'll get on with the positive side of the work. If you fear God, you fear no one else. Now we come to Nehemiah as reformer. We've seen Nehemiah the cupbearer, Nehemiah the builder, and now Nehemiah the reformer. Chapter 13, the last chapter in the Bible. I'll have to leave you to go home and read these chapters. The walls are built. The enemies are confounded. Nehemiah goes back to Susa back to his job, back to the king, Artaxerxes. And 12 years later, he says to the king, it's about time I had some more leave. And the king said, right off you go, Nehemiah. And he said, I want to go and see how they're getting on. And he went. And he found a sad, sad state. The building was finished. But it was what was happening inside those walls. 12 years. I shudder when I read this and ask myself, what will we be like in 12 years' time inside that new building? We'll have a lovely building still. But what would a Nehemiah find? What did he find? He found corruption inside the people of God. There were three things he found that were wrong, and he put them right, and he prayed about each thing. He found corrupt priests lining their own pockets, not interested in leading the worship, only in it for the job, professional priests. 
And so they were taking all the money from the collection and spending it on themselves. They weren't even paying for the music of the temple to be continued. And Nehemiah prayed and he said, Lord, help me to get rid of these men. Help me to appoint proper treasurers to look after the funds. The funds were being abused. The second thing he found were Sabbath traders. The shops were all opening on the Lord's day. The people of God were so anxious to make money that they did business on the Sabbath. They were doing it seven days a week. They didn't give God even one day in seven. And he prayed again and he said, help me to deal with these people. And he threw them out and so they set up shops just outside the gates so that people could slip out on the Sabbath and buy just outside. Do you know there are always people who find a way of keeping just outside the law, aren't there? And Nehemiah said it's not good enough to be just outside the law and he commanded the gates to be shut every Sabbath. And then he found that the people of God were marrying people who were not people of God. And that had been forbidden and it still is. There are few things that make a church, church's witness more difficult than when the children of God marry people who are not the children of God. It's going to handicap their witness for the rest of their life. And it does. And so that's what Nehemiah found. That they were loving the girls around in the foreign tribes living nearby. And so they were marrying, not for spiritual reasons, but for physical attraction and mental compatibility, but not spiritual unity. And it says he took hold of the husbands and he dragged them by the hair. And he said, out with this. You're mixing the people of God if you marry someone outside the people of God. Now it takes a man of tremendous courage. He wasn't tackling Sanballat. He wasn't speaking <clears throat> to King Artaxerxes. He was actually reforming the people of God. And believe me, that's not the way to win friends and influence people. But he did it. And he was very unpopular. And so each time he did a thing like this, he said, Lord, remember me. Remember me for doing this. They've remembered me for doing it, but will you remember me? Will you vindicate what I'm doing? I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. It's not popular what I'm saying. I'm trying to put the people right, and they don't like it. Will you remember me? And he prayed that prayer four times. But he not only prayed negative prayers, getting rid of things that were wrong, he prayed positive prayers. And in verse 31, he says, Remember me, God for good because, and it says in verses 30 and 31 what he did, he gave them priests and Levites to lead the worship. He said, bring the first fruits of your income. Bring the offerings, bring the first fruits. Don't bring God what is left over from your cash. Bring the first fruits of what you earn. And so he got things put right. But he was now crossing swords with his friends. And the culprits now were his own people. But he did it with prayer. And he said, Lord, remember me for good. Well, then here is Nehemiah, this great man of prayer. A man who was prepared to tackle the enemy and a man, man who was prepared to tackle his friends. A man who prayed against Sanballat and prayed when he was in the presence of Artaxerxes. But a man who prayed when he attacked the high priest too. And a man who saw that you not only need a new building, you need good people inside it. A man who saw that even if you get the walls up to the glory of God, if you compromise the principles of God inside the building, then there was no point in putting the walls up. And a man who prayed and said, God, I know that you're right to curse us, to delay the building if we're sinning, but Lord, you promised if we confessed to bless and to bring us back.